that third presentation, <laughs> Igor Lodensin, he teaches the New Testament at Friedrich South Adventist University, where he is also the doctoral program coordinator. He holds a PhD in the New Testament from Andrews University Seminary, and he has just completed the habilitation process in the world. So, the title of his presentation is Cosmic Conflict in the Gospel of Mark and its significance for the Seventh-day Adventist message. Let's welcome you. Thank you for the opportunity to present here. Cosmic conflict in the Gospel of Mark. And what does it have to do with Seventh-day Adventists? So you can follow along the version from the ISRS webpage. I will uh, follow it closely. Cosmic conflict is a very important meta narrative for Seventh day Adventists. Among lay members of the church, it is commonly connected to Ellen G. Weiss' book, The Great Controversy, <coughs> as we heard this morning by Michael, which deals with the conflict caused by Satan and his helpers throughout the ages. If looking for a biblical base of it, Seventh-day Adventists would usually point to Revelation chapter 12, with its war in heaven between Christ and Satan. They are not the only Christians to take their inspiration for the cosmic conflict from the book of Revelation. Recently, Craig Coster wrote the following about its message, and I'm quoting the book of Revelation, Coster says, depicts a cosmic drama in which the Creator, the Lamb, and their allies engage in conflict with the destroyers of the earth. Revelation's images of cosmic conflict that are designated to shape the reader's perspective and manner of life in the context of your daily. By depicting sharply contrasting figures, the writer challenges readers to see themselves in a world of contending powers <coughs> where no one has the luxury of neutral space. The central question is which forms of authority will most influence people and their response to the issues before them. End quote. According to Revelation, the cosmic conflict is universal, involving God and destroyers of the destroyers of his creation, while all humanity is involved in the struggle. Since the book of Revelation finds the roots of its concepts and motives in the Old Testament background, it is natural to look for the traces of that war in its pages. But there is surprisingly little mention of Satan in the Old Testament in comparison to, it, to his presence in the book of Revelation. Now the question, how is it possible that we have such an unbalance between Satan's appearance by name in the Old Testament as compared to his appearance by name in the book of Revelation. Is there an interest in Satan in other Christian literature prior to the Apocalypse? The book of Revelation is a Christian book and it, its fundament is in the Gospel story with the events of life and ministry of Jesus of Nazareth forming the base for the message of the heavenly Jesus depicted in the Apocalypse. In this paper, I want to look into the first written gospel account and search for the cosmic conflict narrative in its storyline. The Gospel of Mark is considered today to be the first written gospel, thus being older than the Johannian writings and the book of Revelation. Now the questions. What was Mark's view of the cosmic conflict and how does he depict it? We have heard already aspects from two different uh, events in the Gospel of Mark. So, it has not been customary for Seventh-day Adventists to look into the Gospels for the cosmic conflict motif. But being the first Gospel account, that's not the major question, how does the book of Mark help us to understand the cosmic conflict and the role of Satan in the transition between the Old Testament and the book of Revelation? 
the event of Jesus Christ, with his cross, death, and resurrection, forced early Christians to reread the Old Testament in the light of their recent historical events. It was clear to them that in Jesus' death, the forces of evil were at work, and that the evil could not be the same after the resurrection. Simply stated, his resurrection and heavenly ministry have consequences, and the Gospel of John, as the last written New Testament Gospel, offers the cosmic conflict perspective. For example, John 12, 31, or John 16, verse 11, and some other places. It has become customary to read the Gospel stories from the end, from the Passion, and to consider the Gospel narrative to be the Passion story with a long introduction. STAs also like to read the New Testament from the end, and easily project the storyline of Revelation into the rest of the Bible. But Revelation seems to be the culmination of the biblical narrative. So historically speaking, later biblical writers were building on the previous contributions and were expanding on them. Now, how does Mark depict the cosmic conflict and what is his contribution to the storyline? As the first written gospel, his account depicts the cosmic conflict already at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And we will develop the details of his storyline in this paper. In this gospel, Satan is directly mentioned by name for, in four events. First of all, the temptation of Jesus, Mark 1, 13. Secondly, the tying up of the strong man, Mark 3. Thirdly, the parable of sowing the word, Mark 4. And fourthly, Peter's tempting of Jesus, Mark 8. So, Satan is also present in other scenes in the Gospel of Mark without being directly named or mentioned. It, I will now attempt to present the cosmic conflict narrative in Mark without a claim to be exhaustive in my overview. So let us start from chapter one. So instead of focusing on one specific event like we just had in two presentations, we will try to cover the entire Gospel of Mark now. We will not be able, but you can follow it later then in the paper, but at least we will try to show it in the first three chapters and then as well as the end of the, uh, at the end of the Gospel. So, the beginning of the Gospel, Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 10. Mark is the first to introduce the Greek term oiangelion in the Gospels. He is about to communicate the good news. He starts with a reference to Isaiah chapter 40 and with John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus and his appearance. And now in verse 11 of first chapter, during his baptism, a voice comes from heaven over Jesus, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. Heaven intervenes on behalf of Jesus and sends a message. There is no presence of Satan up to now, but directly after this intervention of heaven on behalf of Jesus, uh, in the next verse, Satan himself appears. So the next verse, Mark 1, verse 12, immediately Jesus was tested by Satan for 40 days in the wilderness. As soon as Jesus is named the Son of God, Satan comes to the scene to tempt him. With his baptism, Jesus publicly accepted his role as the Messiah, and the forces of evil immediately engaged themselves. It is the first mention of Satan in the Gospel, but Jesus is not alone since angels are attending him, heaven takes care of their chosen intermediary. Mark 1, verse 15, Jesus announces the kingdom of God for the first time proclaiming the good news. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. So Jesus starts actively being engaged in the conflict, helping heaven to spread its agenda on earth. In Mark, Jesus is in a liminal space helping heaven to make a difference on earth. Mark 1, 16 to 20, Jesus needs some helpers for the conflict that is about to culminate, so he calls his first disciples. 
They need to be trained to confront the evil as well. So the kingdom's agenda can be advanced on earth. It is a real conflict between heaven and earth. Mark 1, 23 to 28, Jesus confronts the evil spirit and drives him out. In the conflict, evil has to give the territory over to Jesus. Heaven's agenda is spreading and the kingdom is expanding. Mark 1, 29 to 31, Jesus even heals sickness, which is in the ancient world, which in the ancient world might have been seen as the evil spirit of sickness. Jesus casts it out. Any type of evil has to go away in his presence. God's kingdom is spreading and nothing can prevent its advancement. Mark 1, 32 to 34, many who are sick and demon possessed are healed by Jesus on a single evening. God's kingdom spreads and gains massive territory from the evil. Mark 1, 35, Jesus goes to a solitary place for the purpose of praying. He recharges his energies for the conflict with the evil on earth in his fellowship with God in heaven. His mission comes from heaven and he continues being in con contact with its source in heaven so he can move the things on earth. Mark 1, uh, Mark, Mark, yeah, still, uh, still Mark 1, uh, 38 to 39, Jesus goes to five <coughs> places to widen the territory of the kingdom. The summary of Mark states, and he went throughout Galilee proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Heaven's agenda is spreading. Mark 1, 40 to 45, Jesus heals the man with leprosy, sickness disappears in his presence. Up to now, diverse conflicts with evil happened in the first introductory chapter of the gospel. Thus, setting the stage for the advancement of God's kingdom and the conquest of evil. And David Rodas claims, I'm quoting, the arrival of the rule of God represents a renewal of the whole creation. Jesus proclaims the arrival of the rule of God at the outset of Mark's story and in a sense, the rest of the story plays out the consequences and projects the fulfillment of that momentous announcement into the imminent future. Jesus has started his agenda, and we have just covered only chapter 1 of Mark and that introduction into the cosmic conflict. We are going now to the chapter 2, second chapters, verses 1 and 2, crowds gather to hear Jesus, there is no space for everyone who wants to see and hear him, so the kingdom is gaining momentum, and nothing can keep it down. Mark 2, verse 10, Jesus has the authority to forgive sins, he is gaining the authority, uh, he is gaining the territory of the evil, and helping people with his approach not to sin anymore, thus the territory of the evil shrinks. Chapter 2, 14 to 18, Jesus calls sinners to his kingdom and takes them away from the domain of evil. Thus God's kingdom advances among the evildoers where no one would actually expect its presence. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, Jesus even spreads the kingdom in the synagogue by healing a man on the Sabbath. But Pharisees, they don't like it and plot with the Herodians to kill him. The evil organizes themselves against Jesus, while, the, while he continually spreads heaven's agenda. Mark 3, 7 to 9, a great multitude is following Jesus, a great number of people came from the surrounding countries, as well as from pagan territories. When there is no understanding in Israel, God attracts pagans to his kingdom. Mark 3, 10 to 12, Jesus is a well-known healer, sickness cannot stand in his presence, demons they feared him and publicly pronounced him to be the son of God. 3, 13 to 19, Jesus appoints the 12 apostles to help in spreading heaven's agenda. He empowers them to drive out demons and further spread out the territory of the kingdom. And now Mark 3, 20 to 27, Jesus' family is concerned about his well-being, since scribes from Jerusalem claim that he has Beelzebub and works in cooperation with the ruler of the demons. Jesus logically replies that Satan cannot drive out Satan. He is in the business of tying up the strong man, restraining and casting out Satan. The forces of evil need to be 
eliminated. And now we are jumping over to page 8, mark 14, verses 1 to 3, if you are following in the, in the manuscript. Mark 14, the chief priests and the scribes are looking for a way to kill Jesus. The forces of evil are preparing for the final battle. The representative of heaven needs to be removed. The kingdom's agenda needs to be stopped. The cosmic conflict is unfolding. Mark 14, 10 to 11, Judas is ready to help the forces of evil. He cooperates with the chief priests and takes plans with them to betray Jesus. Evil uses people to achieve its goal, goals, and Jesus knows about, about such plans. Mark 14, 22 to 25, Jesus celebrates the Passover with his disciples, the Feast of Liberation, pointing to his death for many. His death will have a liberating significance in the cosmic conflict. He is pointing his disciples to the big celebration feast of victory in the kingdom of heaven. Thus, Jesus offers for the first time in Mark an eschatological perspective of the battle with the evil. Mark 14, 26 to 31, Jesus gives some specific advice to his disciples regarding the coming battle. Peter believes that he is able to stand fast in trouble and other disciples believe it as well. People are not aware of how strong the forces of evil are and how easy it is to fall. Soon after that, Jesus needs them to stay awake with him in prayer, but they are all asleep. Mark 14, 43 to 52, one of the 12 from the cycle of, uh, uh, cycle of his closest disciples betrays him. Circumstances can easily deceive even the faithful and forces of evil can take control. <coughs> 1453 to 65, the high priest, the chief priest, the elders, and the scribes, they all assemble for a trial of Jesus. The forces of evil bring false accusations against him. He testifies in front of the highest Jewish, Jewish court that he is the Messiah, the one who is bringing liberation to Israel and the world, but all of them condemn him and reject his testimony as blasphemy. Evil seems to be winning. Mark 6, uh, uh, 14, 66 to 72, Peter is not standing strong in these critical moments as he has hoped, but betrays Jesus three times. The closest disciples are, are leaving Jesus. The evil advances into the territory of the kingdom of God and disturbs heaven's agenda. Pressed by circumstances, people can easily fall. Mark 15, 1 to 15, the earthly Roman court is questioning Jesus and finding him not guilty of any crime. The crowd, stirred up by the chief priest, requires the crucifixion of Jesus. The forces of evil use faithful human agents for their own agenda. Mark 15, 16 to 38, by the crucifixion of Jesus, all the forces of evil come together. There is mocking, torturing, and laughing at Jesus by the gathered people. A darkness come, comes over the whole land, testifying that whole of nature is involved in, to the, in, in the conflict. Mark 15, 39 to 47, when his disciples left him, others are moved to confess Jesus. The Roman centurion, overwhelmed by the events, confesses under the cross, truly, this man was the son of God. So, the cosmic conflict theme is present throughout the narrative of the gospel and is constitutive to the message of Mark. The struggle between heaven and earth, between powers of good and evil, is determining the narrative story. This investigation confirms David Rodas' statement and quoting Mark depicts the rule of God moving toward the universal, real, encompassing all of creation. The cosmic conflict between God and Satan is foundational to all the other conflicts in the narrative, end quote. Not only are characters in the story involved in the cosmic conflict, but also the audience listening, the reader is also involved. And there is a response expected from the audience, and I have here another quote by David Rodas talking about it. In conclusion, I have examined Mark's approach to the cosmic conflict theme, located between the Old Testament sparing references to Satan and the book of Revelation's saturation with them, as well as with the cosmic conflict motif, we have discovered that Mark mentions Satan by name more often in his gospel than the entire Old Testament does. 
through the cosmic conflict motif, Satan is present in Mark also in many scenes where he is not directly mentioned. It seems that the event of Jesus Christ, his life, death, and resurrection needed to be interpreted by the early Christians in the light of the Old Testament and with its significance for the newly developing Christian mo mo movement. In the event of Jesus, they saw a clash between heaven and earth, between forces of good and evil. The God of the universe has dealt with the evil in this world through Jesus. Thus, they developed the cosmic conflict theme, which forms the backdrop of the first gospel of the rest of the New Testament, and which goes on to be further developed and expanded on in the book of Revelation. So that conflict, cosmic conflict motif, is not a late Christian invention, but belongs to the earliest tradition about Jesus of Nazareth and his ministry. Finally, the question is, what can STAs learn from this earliest Christian cosmic conflict account depicted in Mark? What is its consequence for today's proclamation of the gospel? The cosmic conflict motif depicts a, a scenario in which all of humanity is involved. And the book of Revelation points its readers to the need to decide whom they will worship. The ultimate end of all evil is expected in Revelation with Jesus is soon coming. People need to hear that gospel story. And Mark is depicting that same cosmic conflict already during the life and ministry of Jesus. His earthly life culminating on the cross and resurrection is the base for all hope of the humanity. And thus, Jesus' earthly ministry is an integral component of the cosmic conflict and the base for his future actions as he is sitting on the heavenly throne. Thank you for your attention.